Hi, I'm Rick Dior, and this is part two of my Making Drumsticks series. So I've just inhaled a bunch of sawdust because I'm making sticks today. So I'm a little bit, um, you know, stuffed up here. So I, excuse me for that. Also, uh, normally I do this outside, but because of the sunlight uh, today, and it's pretty windy up here in the mountains, I'm going to come in here in my garage and... Uh, do this so we can see a little better. So I'm not going to show you too much because I don't want to <laughs> give away all my trade secrets, but I am going to show you, for those of you who are thinking about buying sticks or bought sticks, how I make these. I think you might find it pretty interesting. So in the last video you saw how I cut up the wood and into squares and then I make dowels out of it. So here are the dowels and these are what I call roughed out dowels. So a lot of times I will uh, this is one of the things I am not going to show you how I do because it's, the, it's the, pretty much the, the most important part of making the stick uh, is the shape of it. I'll show you a few things, but you can experiment on your own. But it took me years to figure out all my ratios and I have all kinds of measurements that I've used. Uh, I spent about five years learning how to do this on my own and really you have to be a player. Uh, in other words, you have to know what a good pair of sticks feel lot, feels like. You can't just be a, a good turner, and I consider myself a good wood turner, but there are some great wood turners. I am not a great wood turner out there. But the problem is they don't play percussion, so they don't know what a stick is supposed to feel like. So years ago, uh, I actually took some lessons with a great wood turner. This guy is just a, a genius, really. And I learned how to make bowls and spindles and all that. And I told him, you know, I want to make drumsticks. And he said, oh, I showed him a stick. He said, oh, that's easy. And so he, he goes, I'll make you a pair and you'll come back next week and, uh, and let me know what you think. So I left him my stick that I brought and he, he made me a pair of sticks. They were awful, just horrible. The weight was all wrong. The balance was all wrong. I tried to explain to him and he, you know, he basically picked up a stick and was you know, doing this with it, you know, he just doesn't understand, uh, didn't understand about the balance and the balance you have to have. So that is the difference. You have to know about all those things. And one little increment wrong on a stick will basically ruin the whole thing. That's why there are some really great drumsticks out there, especially the old Reamer sticks. William Reamer was just amazing. He had that ratio down, uh, you know, to the most bounce you can get for the weight of the stick versus the, um, the way that the, uh, the tip works with the rest of the body, uh, you know, how big the back of the stick should be. There's a lot of little tiny adjustments that you have to make. So I've worked through all these things and I, I kept scrupulous notes and um, I was able to come up with some really good formulas for making several different models that I make. But my favorite, as you know, is the barrel tipped stick that uh, that I use all the time. I feel like a barrel tip gives me the best uh, you know thing between articulation and you can also play really good roles with it. But I do make other sticks for people all the time. I make a reverse tip, I make oval tips, I make diamond tips. So I'm all, you know people custom order stuff and I'm doing that and I'm fine with that. But most of my, my clients or people that buy sticks from me will make will buy a barrel tip from there. All right, so uh, everything is really important when you're doing this. Now, the diameter of the stick, like I always like to say, I don't make them too thick. I pretty much, it's around the 5 eighths area. So just like my set sticks, it's, you know, about that thick so I don't have to change my fulcrum when I'm playing. I don't like the idea of using like a uh, marching band, uh, you know, diameter stick, which makes me, you know, really open up my hand too much. So you don't have to get weight that way. The way to get the weight from the stick is just use heavier woods. And that's what I do. So instead of maple and hickory, I use, uh, my lightest is persimmon, as you know. And then I go to everything over that, like yellow heart, bloodwood, wenge, uh, zebra wood, leopard wood. And you know, sometimes I run out of these woods and I have to get more. So it's a whole process. But right now I got a good deal of uh, leopard wood that I've been letting dry and that I've cut up uh, for a couple years actually. So that's ready to go. And that's what this is. So this is leopard wood in its raw form. So those of you with leopard wood sticks, 
This is what it looked like in the beginning. Not much really, kind of just brown with some spots. I don't know if you could see those if I go real close. but And then you see I've already shaped the stick. So the shaft here, and the, this is called the taper. And I'm going to change that, but that's the I've roughed these in. So I do that. And I take a day, and I rough in the sticks, and I weigh them. I get them exactly the same weight when I rough them in. And that's really important. A lot of sticks you buy now, the weight's all messed up. I try to get them, I always try to get them exactly, which is really hard to do, but never more than um, two grams, uh, which is hardly anything separate. Uh, usually it, they're right on, but usually one to 0.5 grams, that's an okay tolerance. You'll never feel that. But anything more than two grams, I feel that. So you may, depending on how sensitive your, your technique is. All right, so that's what it looks like, and that's the original uh, diameter of the stick, and then you see I've taken some off of it already. And then it's ready to go on the lathe. And by the way, this is leopard wood. This is tiger wood. I got some more of that in, not much. I managed to get a little more of that in because people really loved it, but it's hard to get. And this is heartwood, so it's heavier. I don't know what this thing is. What's my wife's hair? What is that doing there? <laughs> okay. And then this is persimmon. You saw me make these the other day. These are from what I was doing in my first video. I made these dowels, so it's all ready to go. And today I'm going to try to make most of these. That'll work out to be probably seven or eight pair. That takes a whole day to do that. And then I finish them. And when I finish them, I use a very light finish. I don't use a heavy, uh, heavy gloss finish or anything like that. I don't like that because it feels bad to me, slippery. The finish I use is a combination of poly and beeswax. And it's protective, but it feels good. There's a great grip to these sticks. A lot of the sticks now, they use this really glossy poly. Um, and the grip is bad. So when you sweat, you lose it. And with my stuff that I use with a little bit of beeswax and all, the grip is great. So in a concert or whatever, if you're sweating a little, or if you're playing under hot lights, it's not going to be an issue with that. Now, if, if some of you want to tr get the tips treated a little more, so they last a little longer, you can just dip those in a high gloss poly. A flooring finish works great. So all you do is you take the stick, and you dip it in there and then leave it. Okay, and then once it dries and stops dripping, you just put it down. And I recommend people maybe do that, you know, once a year. Because the tips with this hard wood are going to wear out eventually. Especially if you play on mesh heads, don't do that. We've talked about that in the other videos. That's like sanding your sticks down. Also, if you play on a practice pad with a coated head, like a Remo or a Sabian, I sand those down a little. And that'll save your tips. But I've been using the same pair of leopard wood uh, sticks and zebra wood as well for almost 20 years now. And those are the ones you saw me recently using for all the rudimental stuff, as well as the classical stuff. I have hundreds of videos in the past couple months up there. And you, you'll see those sticks, they're the original everything, obviously. So they last a really, really long time if you take care of them. And if your, technique, if your technique is good, if you're playing and you're sticking on the drum and you're not bouncing off, yeah, you're going to wear out your tips because you're basically, you know, rubbing the head with them. So you've got to get off the head. So the, these things are important. Okay, so what we're going to do today is I'll show you. I'm going to do a little bit of a leopard wood tip here. And I make my own lathe tools. So I'll take a, a tool and grind it down. This is a sorby. Tool. I like their handles, they feel good. And I'll take it, I'll cut it up, I'll grind it down. Uh, this is like a tip that I'll use for my, my barrel tipped sticks. I have other, I like little tools for pen making. I use that because I can get re really close in there. So those are the things I do. Now you do need to have training uh, on spindle making to do this because uh, you have to have a really steady hand. This is called the tool rest, this thing here. And that's important. This is a very small lathe. The one back in Charlotte is giant. I've shown you some pictures of that at the end of my riveting, symbol riveting video. Uh, that's where I do all the heavy work, like roughing these out. Because this is such hard wood, you've got to have a really powerful lathe. For the finish work, though, you don't need anything really powerful. This is just a cheap jet 
uh, lathe. I can't even remember the model. I think it's a 1220 or something. It's old. And uh, it's, it's fine. You know, nothing fancy. It doesn't have the digital controls. It just has basic speeds. It's very quiet. It's belt driven, which I like. A lot of the new digital ones, they're great too, but the belt ones work fine and I know how to replace the belts. So with the digital stuff, if something goes wrong, you're kind of screwed. you got to get a new motor. With the belts, the belt will just break and then you put a new one on. So I prefer that stuff. Same thing with old cars, you know. Can't fix anything anymore. I used to fix my Chevy Nova. I could take that thing apart and put it back together. Not anymore. So that's the way we're going. So if you, if you want to get a lathe, get an older one with a belt. That's for, for spindle making. All right. It doesn't need to be fancy, really. You're not going to use that many speeds. I do have, this is, uh, you can change speeds on this. So I, I go almost full speed, so I'll show you that. That's the slowest speed. I'll speed it up. So that's all the way up. Uh, and for any kind of, you know, using tools or sanding, I usually go full speed for that. If I have to do any fine work, like cut an edge or uh, shape something, I'll go a little bit slower, normally. You don't have to do that. That's just what I do. All right, so uh, as far as other tools I use, I use all kinds of old school calipers. I do have digital calipers. I do like those for certain things, but uh, I have a lot of these. They're really old. Some of these belong to my grandfather. He was a, a, a pattern maker. Uh, he made dresses and things like that, worked with all kinds of fabrics. So I inherited these tools, some of them are over 100 years old. Uh, but they're just regular calipers and I have all my markings written down for particular sticks and I adjust the calipers to that before I play. I mean, before I uh, start making them. This is another really, really old one I love. It's like, it's, uh, it's made in Switzerland. And I can measure my tips just, you know, to nothing really. It's very, very, uh, very, very subtle. And this is what I use for thickness. It's a thickness gauge. So again, I have a certain taper I like to use. My sticks usually get a little bit wider by the time I get to the butt there. And then I use some old school calipers, which are very fine uh, that I use for my tips, for shapes like that. So I have lots and lots of these, and uh, I have everything written down, like I said, and I just take out what I need. So today I'm going to be making some barrel tips, and also someone has a custom order. They want kind of a diamond tip, so I'm going to be doing that. And, uh, oh, this is the last tool I use. It's just a, a marking gauge, and I use this for my tips as well. These things are great. So it's just completely adjustable. Hope you can see that. And my favorite tool, I don't know what this is called, but I have two of them. And I got these years ago. This is what I use for my taper. Can you see that? Hopefully. <laughs> and it's super adjustable, like so I can make any shape out of it that I want. So I love these kinds of things. I have lots and lots of these. So I can, you know, get a taper like that and check it from stick to stick and just see how it's going. So it's very tedious, as you can imagine. Uh, it's not like you just pop a piece of wood on there and you just make a stick. That's going to be good. It, it takes a lot of years and the real good drumstick makers, you know, they have, uh, or we have, a lot of experience. Like I said, I have 20 years of experience doing this. And, uh, you know, sometimes you have a bad day where you have a lot of some bad wood and that's the worst. We end up throwing out pretty much everything you make and that happens sometimes. Sometimes you have a great day, you just go and a lot of it depends on the wood, you know, the quality of the wood. And it's getting harder and harder to get good quality wood. That's why certain companies, uh, Reamer being one, uh, I know Andy Reamer's making sticks still, but they've stopped using persimmon, which is a shame, because those old persimmon sticks that they made were great. Um, now they're using hickory. And they're still really good, don't get me wrong, but, uh, but to me it's not the same. Uh, hickory is a good wood, but it's not like persimmon. That's my opinion, anyway. Just got a splinter. Oh. All right. So let's put on the gloves so we don't get any more splinters. And as always, always uh, use safety equipment. So that's going to definitely include actually a mask. And hopefully you'll hear me. You will, you should. And gloves because these things are still rough. And 
Splinters from Wenge and le Leopard Wood are bad. They will fester and get in there and get infected. They have some weird, weird oils in there. Persimmon, not so much. So we'll start with this Leopard Wood. And what we're going to do now is we're going to cut the shape of it. So the length. Everybody likes different lengths in their sticks. So let's see here. I put my tape. Let me grab my tape here. So you can just use a uh, tailor's tape like this. These work fine. And I'm going to measure out this stick and just see where we're at. So we got a good 18 inches, 19 actually. And I want to make this stick, this is a special order, so I'm going to make this stick 17 inches. Normally I go 16 and a half. Some people like a longer stick, which is fine. And I'm just going to check one thing here. Good. Okay. So I'm going to start cutting. And to do that, you mark it off. So you mark off your tip. And hopefully you can see this. All right, so we're now we're marking off the stick. So you gotta be careful because this leopard wood's really hard. It'll jump. It'll make tools jump. I'm gonna oil this thing up. All right. So once you do your first your first cut, then you're going to measure. Good. All right. And I pretty much know exactly where that is now after all these years. And then we'll do the same thing here. All right, so that's the length of a stick. That's the first thing you want to do if you're messing around, okay? Now, the next thing you want to do is what's complicated. You want to shape the stick. So, first thing is you get rid of all this waste in the back. Now you notice how slow I go because you know you got to be really careful of what you're taking off. So now I got my basic shape for the butt, and what I'm gonna do is get this tool here and I'm gonna shape the butt. So you saw there is a lot of sharpening involved. Normally I have something called a Tormek, which is a wet wheel. Uh, I have a big one in Charlotte. I don't have one. They're very expensive, so I don't have one here yet. And that's what I use for sharpening. So I'll, I'll go from making the stick, you know, working on the stick to sharpening back and forth and back and forth. Always sharp. Normally with a softer wood like persimmon, you wouldn't even hear that much noise. But this wood is hard, you know, the, so you hear that. 
So uh, that's it now. And then what I'll do is I'll take some sandpaper and I will even that up. You don't want to do that with a lathe tool because if you do that with a lathe tool, you're bound to screw up and make it too thin. So there's our butt. We're going to cut it a little more deeper here, a little deeper. I'm going to move the camera a little closer so you can see. Let's see if we can do this. And we'll angle it down. Okay, so now we're going to focus on this. So, right there, you see how I've cut. That's going to be a cutoff. That's going to get cut off the lathe, this part. All right? and But you can't cut it too thin. Otherwise, when you put pressure on it, the whole stick will bounce right off the lathe. So I just have to leave that in there. And then, depending if the customer wants it rounded on the end, you can go in there and do this. Alright, so a lot of it's done with sandpaper, believe it or not, once you get the basic shape of the stick. So this particular stick, he wanted it bigger on the end, so the whole taper is going smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. All right, that's how that's going to work. So that's our length now of this thing. I'll check it one more time just to be sure. That'll be the top of it. Yep, so I'm going to probably end up cutting some of the top off, obviously. So that'll be just about right. All right, and then the hard part. Then you go to the tip. So this, this is where it's... There's really no easy way to do this. Now, the, um, I gotta order this once again. The drumstick manufacturers have machines that do this, and basically they just, it just spits them out. It does all this. You don't have to do anything by hand. That's why they can sell them so cheap. All right, I think that, let me fast, get a little bit closer there. There we go. Okay. All right, and now what I'm going to do is shape this thing. Now, this takes a while, so we may run out of batteries. If we do, I apologize.
Okay, so hopefully you can see that. Now that's a, he wants a big tip. <laughs> I don't know what he's going to use these for, but uh, maybe cooking. But anyway, that's, that's a tip. That's it. So, you know, I've been doing this a really long time, so I can do it quickly. The first time you try it, it's probably going to be really funny. But you can try it, and that's perfectly, I don't know, hopefully you can see that's perfectly shaped. And then I just do the other one just like it. And what I do is I take a caliper and I will, and this is where I use a digital caliper sometimes, and I'll open it up and lock it. And that way, when I make the other stick, I'm going back and forth and, you know, making sure they're exactly the same. All right, well, take care and let me know if you have any questions that aren't about uh, anything I... <laughs> I haven't spoken about. Take care. Bye-bye.